Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode. Today's episode has to do with the Civil War, and the topic comes from listener David Santee, who asks this question. I really enjoyed your Civil War series that you did, and I have a follow-up question with that. You mentioned that Union generals got better, and Confederate generals got worse as the war went on. Can you follow up on that? All right, well, I love wide-open questions like this because it gives me a lot of leeway to take the question wherever I want to go. The issue of why Union generals tended to get better and Confederate generals tended to get worse as the war went on can be attributed to all sorts of issue. One is simple manpower. The Union Army had a much larger manpower supply, so at every single rank from private up to general, there were simply more generals available. And in the first year or two of the war, the Union generals were not that great, at least those in command. They kept losing victories over and over again to Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and other figures. What I want to do in this episode is I want to zero in on a couple of character studies that perhaps can give a bigger picture understanding of this question. So first, I'll be looking at Robert E. Lee. And a lot of my information for this episode comes from the Edward Bonnekemper book, Myth of the Lost Cause, because Lee is a good stand-in for a lot of the issues that plague Union generals. It wasn't simply their ability to fight the war that made them better or worse. It was also the overall aims of the war, which Jefferson Davis was dictating on high, And it made it difficult for the Confederate generals to win battles, but still execute the strategy of the Confederacy, which was a little bit flawed. Then I'm going to jump ahead to an issue of the Union Army waging total war, because this tells us about Northern strategy as well. Now, when discussing Robert E. Lee, something I've mentioned many times before in this podcast is that he is difficult to separate myth from history because he's the patron saint of the lost cause of the Confederacy myth. It's a historical theory that holds the cause of the Confederacy was a just and heroic one, that it was a struggle for states' rights, for the Southern way of life in the face of overwhelming Northern aggression, and that the role of slavery wasn't really the purpose of the Civil War. But it was the constitutional right for states to determine law, and states were sovereign in the Federal Republic. And the way Robert E. Lee fits into this narrative is he was a genius general who should have won, and the only reason he didn't was due to overwhelming manpower numbers in the North. This view took hold shortly after Robert E. Lee's death in 1870, and many people soon after thought that Lee fought extremely well while Grant's armies were butchered by Grant's own aggressiveness. The approach has been to emphasize Lee's victories in 1862 and 1863, the period where Lee was highly successful, and that ties into our question why Confederate generals are so good in the beginning. Then they cast Antietam as a victory, but then they blame Lee's Gettysburg defeat on others, and they stress the heavy casualties he imposed on Grant's army in the 1864 Overland Campaign. Michael Fellman says that Lee's final general order to his army, praising their unsurpassed courage and fortitude, and asserting they had been forced to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources, was the beginning of the lost cause. He adds, At the McLean House, suffering the physical death of military surrender, the Confederacy became immortal. Exactly here can one find the essential moment of origin of the lost cause, which Robert E. Lee was the effective first father. Southern white nationalism arose from the ashes of the lost cause, to a considerable extent because of the prideful spirit Lee both articulated and embodied. He was a sacrificial lamb, a Confederate Christ on the cross at Appomattox, who then was resurrected by others in the spirit and the body politic. Before he died, he also became the soft-spoken but implacable foe of submission and conciliation. The success of this pro-Lee campaign, notes John Keegan is curious, he writes, The only cult general in the English-speaking world, Robert E. Lee, was the paladin of its only component community to suffer military catastrophe, the Confederacy. After the Civil War, historians dealt with Lee as with most other participants in the war, treating him positively for the most part, but discussing his faults. The treatment was similar to newspapers' treatment of Lee during the war itself, when Stonewall Jackson rivaled or surpassed him as the most adored Confederate general. 
Both men were celebrated in death as martyrs for the Confederacy. The first historians after the war praised Lee, but found fault with his actions at Gettysburg and other battles, sometimes at Antietam, Fredericksburg, and the Seven Days Battle. Other Confederate generals like Jackson, Longstreet, Joseph Johnson, Albert Johnston, and other people that if you really want to dig into their story, there's a 20-plus episode series I did with James Early, Key Battles of the Civil War. But anyway, among all the other Confederate generals, they generally received favorable treatment. Richard Ewell and Jubal Early were universally criticized for their timidity on the first day of Gettysburg. And one author, Edward Pollard, wrote in The Lost Cause in 1866 that Lee's influence on the Confederacy's fortunes was completely negative. But after his death in 1870, Lee became a Southern and then a national deity. The groundwork for the transformation was laid as early as 1868, when a Southern publication said he was bathed in the white light that falls directly upon him from the smile of an approving and sustaining God. By 1880, John Daniel, one of Early's former staff officers, wrote, The divinity in Lee's bosom, shown translucent through the man and a spirit, rose up to the godlike. Christ-like images of Lee continued well into the 20th century in the writings of many other historians. One example of this deification is found at the end of Freeman's four-volume Ode to Lee, essentially his history of the Civil War, published in 1935. And if one, only one of all the myriad incidents of his stirring life had to be selected to typify his message as a man, the young Americans who stood in hushed awe that rainy October morning after his death, as their parents wept at the passing of the Southern Arthur, who would hesitate in selecting that incident? It occurred in Northern Virginia, probably on his last visit there. A young mother brought her baby to him to be blessed. He took the infant in his arms and looked at it and then at her and slowly said, teach him he must deny himself. So Lee was sort of a combination of King Arthur and Jesus. Another work that perpetuates the myth of Lee, the Encyclopedia of American Biography in 1974, calls him a rare example of a man who looked like a perfect soldier and was. He fought with the Confederacy, not because he loved warfare, but for Virginia and the abstract principle of states' rights. He was always outnumbered by the enemy, and usually short of food, equipment, and ammunition. He was able without strain to equate the effort for the Confederacy with the effort for Virginia. In some, he was a marvelous soldier, cool, quick, decisive, resourceful, amazingly tactful in dealing with Jefferson Davis, and when defeat eventually faced him, a beautiful loser. I don't hear that phrase much. The one source provided for this analysis is Freeman's R.E. Lee. The myth continued for a quarter century when the Oxford Companion to American Military History in 1999 praised him as a man of high personal character and intelligence, charismatic and charming, a natural leader. As a leading actor in the Civil War legend of martial glory, He's become a legendary figure, an American hero of exceptional nobility, it wrote. The legend rationalizes or rejects characteristics of the man that might lessen his appeal. So after a discussion of his critics and defenders' contentions, the entry on Lee concludes, Whatever his shortcomings, Lee became the white South's greatest hero, and many northern and foreign commentators have praised both the man and the general. The preeminent literary monument to Lee is the classic seven volumes written by Douglas Freeman, the four-volume Pulitzer Prize-winning R.E. Lee, a biography, written in 1934 to 1935, and the three-volume Lee's Lieutenants, a study in command, written in the early 40s. During his 25 years of work on these studies, Freeman, the editor of the Richmond News Leader, saluted Lee's statue each day as he went to work. As early as 1914, in an introduction to Lee's dispatches, Freeman had revealed his view of Lee. He entered upon the year 1863 with a series of victories unbroken from the time he had taken command. He ended the year with the greatest opportunity of his career, lost through the blunders and worse of his subordinates. Lee seemed then the very incarnation of knighthood. So in these volumes, Lee is essentially perfect. He's a pure-blooded Virginian, the finest society America had ever produced. He was intelligent, unerring, and any faults he had almost made him greater. He was so tolerant of the faults of others that sometimes their mistakes would result in defeats for which Lee would be held responsible. And the works that praise Lee the most are usually based on this 
So anyway, you get the idea. For a very long time, this was the narrative that held on Lee. Let's take a closer look at Lee's Civil War record. Now, it would be impossible for anyone to live up to that myth, and Lee's doesn't. He was a great general, don't get me wrong, but no one could be as good as the early myth about Lee was. So that's something to consider, because Confederate generals at the beginning of the war can be so mythologized that it seems like they have a terrible drop in quality as the war goes on, when maybe it's not really the case. They, the faults that they had at the beginning of the war were probably there at the end, and the strengths they had at the beginning of the war were probably there at the end as well. So after declining command of the Union Army because he wouldn't lift a sword against the Commonwealth of Virginia and Lee joined the Confederacy, he did a great job of organizing the Virginia militia and defending the state in the early months of the war. As its militia became part of the Confederacy's army, Lee became President Jefferson Davis's military advisor. He was disappointed that he wasn't on the field for the Confederate victory at First Bull Run, known as the Battle of First Manassas, and Lee continued to lobby for a field command. His wish was granted when he was sent to northwestern Virginia in late 1861, but he demonstrated some of the weaknesses that would plague him throughout the war. At Cheat Mountain, he issued long, complicated orders and failed to exercise hands-on control. While in the small theater, he failed to deal with squabbling subordinates whose disputes were undermining Confederate efforts to regain control of northwestern Virginia, and he returned back to Richmond a failure. Davis then gave Lee a chance for redemption by assigning him to command the South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida coasts. First, Davis had to write letters to affected governors, assuring them that Lee was indeed a highly competent general, contrary to what they may have heard about his Western Virginia experience. Lee did a great job building defensive coastal fortifications and withdrawing most of the rebel defenses to waters beyond the reach of Union gunboats. Apparently because Davis was becoming disenchanted with independent, uncooperative, and personally despised generals such as Joseph Johnson and P.T. Beauregard, he recalled Lee to Richmond as his primary military advisor once again. There, Lee helped Davis to pressure Johnson into more forceful defensive actions, especially after George P. McClellan started slowly moving up the Virginia Peninsula from the Norfolk area toward Richmond. After two months of dalliance, McClellan finally reached the vicinity of Richmond and split his army on both sides of the Chickahominy River. On May 31, 1862, with prodding, Johnson attacked an isolated portion of Little Mac's army on the southern side of the river. In what became the two-day Battle of the Seven Pines, Longstreet bungled his attack and reinforcements from the north of the river were able to avert a Union disaster. The most important result of the battle was that Johnson was badly wounded, and on June 1st, 1862, Lee succeeded to command of the major Confederate army in the east, which he promptly dubbed the Army of Northern Virginia. His record as its commander requires deep examination before judgment can be rendered about the quality of his Civil War performance. Lee enhanced his early war reputation as the King of Spades by ordering his army to dig fortifications south of the Chickahominy between Richmond and McClellan's Army of the Potomac. Contrary to many people's expectations that he would be a cautious general, he was preparing for the first of many offenses against his foes. His strategic and tactical aggressiveness would soon be apparent to all. The Seven Days Battle ended McClellan's disastrous peninsula campaign, which began in late June and was Lee's first as army commander. Correctly predicting that McClellan would not have the moral courage to attack Lee's lines in Richmond while Lee moved his army to the north side of the Chickahominy, Lee took two-thirds of his army above the river and attacked Little Mac's largest corps, which was alone there. In a sign of things to come, Lee had his army attack the enemy for most of one week and push them away from Richmond and back to the James River. Although Lee knew that he had achieved a strategic objective of saving Richmond after two days of fighting, he continued his attack for days more, taking substantial casualties. He was a very offensive fighter. His army suffered 20,000 casualties, dead, wounded, missing, or captured, while McClellan suffered only 16,000, although keep in mind that there's probably not a revolutionary war battle that had 16,000 casualties. Most of Lee's casualties were killed or wounded. Only 10,000 of Little Macs were killed or wounded. That week of fighting was marked by McClellan's constant retreats under his usual misapprehension that he was outnumbered two to one and Lee's overaggressiveness and mismanagement of his army. He generally issued a battle order for the day and then simply let things unfold without close battlefield control by him or his deliberately small staff. 